All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm excited to have Vic Wyant here today to talk about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, Vic started in heating and ventilation and air conditioning uh, longer ago than I did. I won't mention how long it was, but he started in the field, worked his way up. He's got plenty of real life experience. He's seen everything. And uh, 15 years ago, started his own company. And we've had the pleasure of being able to work with him and his guys. Uh, if you have, you know that they're some of the best people out there. Uh, Vic and, and most of his techs are all, all uh, very experienced and really know what's going on. So it's good to have his, uh, his advice here for us. Uh, these are the subjects we're going to cover. Some installation keys. This is, uh, this is really focused on the role of the job site supervisor in managing an HVAC installation. The HVAC guys know what they know. Uh, we get a lot of this, a lot of the things ha are handed to us as part of the design or the shape of an existing house. It's the things that we need to do to make sure that the installation goes correctly. All right, so let's start off with this right away. Uh, one of the first things that'll happen on uh, one of our renovations is we're, we're asked to put a unit in an attic or a crawl space somewhere where there's not a whole lot of room. And so let's just talk about how much room that is required for those so we know where we can put it. Uh, first of all, there's supposed to be a minimum of 30 inch by 30 inch space in front of the unit. Um, so the, in, a, in an attic, that can be a really tight fit, right? If you have the unit up against one side and there's not much room next to it, you gotta make sure you leave yourself some space. Uh, and also a 24 inch wide path to the appliance. So when we're working in a forest of truss braces, we really have to think this through where we're gonna put it. Um, Another thing that they ask for is a three inch minimum space on each side of a unit and a total of 12 inches. There are closets where we work in where that gets to be really tight. So overall, if, uh, if we're working on a design or we're trying to sort out where to put these things, we wanna make sure we have a big space to put them in. Uh, Maryland has a weird provision. A any new construction situation, you have to put a set of stairs up to the unit, either a pull down or a real staircase. So that's something to keep in mind. Luckily, we, uh, we mostly do renovations. And in a renovation situation, you're allowed to use an existing hatchway. Although this is a great idea anyway, right? People like those, and they work really well. So under floors, it's a similar situation, uh, 30 by 30 inch workspace. And uh, they, they want the access pathway to be 30 inches tall. And in fact, you're not supposed to go over 20 feet unless it's six feet tall. So there are probably some crawl spaces where we have to pull the unit toward the access door rather than put it away at the far end if we, if we were looking at that situation. And one other interesting code provision is that the air conditioners are supposed to be a minimum of three inches above grade. And Vic, you were, you were saying that heat pumps, it's even more than that, right? Yeah, most of the manufacturers want you six inches off the ground for a heat pump just for snow buildup will block the air to the bottom of it, so keep them up a little bit. All heat pumps were gonna be six inches up. So that's a, a good point that uh, we're required to install all of these devices per the manufacturer's directions. That's written in code as well. So sometimes those directions require us to do more than what the code language itself says. So a heat pump six inches above in our area. Probably people in Michigan, it's a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that takes care of access and workspace. Um, now for something that's kind of dear to my heart. Um, when. When you work in customer service, you get phone calls uh, for, for leaks, and a lot, it turns out a lot of them are from condensation, either from air conditioners or furnaces. And so uh, how to set up a system that will work reliably is, ends up being a pretty important issue for our clients. So let's start with the beginning. Uh, you want to make sure you have a trap on the primary drain from the air conditioner. What, what's that for? The trap is to keep from drawing air back through the pipe, be fumes, sewer gases, whatever, and then back into the airstream right. to back into the house. So we actually have seen that on a, a couple of units. Um, you know, every once in a while, an HVAC uh, tech is in an attic and can't figure out what to do with the condensate, and they drill a hole in the side of a plumbing vent. And then if they don't put, if the trap ever dries out, it just pulls sewer gas right into the house. Um, and people notice that, believe it or not. So. Uh, one of the tricks we learned from Vic is to use one inch PVC for the condensate line because a three quarter inch, which is the minimum per code, tends to clog, especially on horizontal, right? Yeah, right. longer runs. Short connections will use three quarter, but 
anything with any length are going to have any kind of horizontal length go to one inch. The three quarter will clog real easily. Right. And uh, we used to always say you should use a gravity drain when possible instead of using a condensate pump. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, a pump is just one more thing to break, but they don't seem to break all that often. I'm not sure how important that is. Uh, we keep them in stock on the service trucks. Yeah, so they do, they do break. Yeah. So it, you know, if you, the more, it's more reliable if you're just relying on gravity. Gravity And occasionally can be a noise issue with a pump just intermittently on and right. off. I have seen some weird things with pumps. Uh, one, there was one time we had a client who there was kind of water all over the ductwork in their basement. And we were looking around and looking up above the ductwork and shining our flashlights. We couldn't figure out where all this water came from. And then I uh, was wa walking away and I heard this splashing sound. I ran back and the condensate pump was shooting water up onto the bottom of the ducts because the hose had popped off the bottom of it. So again, it's just one more thing to go wrong. So on drains, we have had a few issues where the drain isn't really the low point in the floor. And if the water trickles across the grate and gets onto the floor, it goes away from the drain. So better to turn that down into the drain. And it's pretty easy to do. I mean, you can just take that grate off or you can smash out some of the bars in the grate. Pretty easy to do. Pretty simple. Um, I guess there's no concern with an air gap or anything like that, right? It's Yeah, as long as there is some form of air gap, which you're pretty much going to have in that scenario. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our houses have water bugs or water sensors uh, or float switches on some of their pans and stuff. Uh, <laughs> one thing you want to be careful of, I don't know if you can see how it says this side faces up on this one right there. Uh, but it doesn't say this side faces down on the bottom. So um, it probably should because I've, I've seen two of these like this where the sensors are facing the wrong direction. Be careful. Uh, so another thing that we sometimes do with condensate drains, especially in a renovation situation where we're, we don't want to make, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to get from the attic to a drain lower in the house, is we stick it in a downspout or a gutter. Um, you got to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, here's one where the gutter worked great, the downspout worked great, and then the water made an ice skating rink on the porch because the, the, that downspout happened to dump out on the porch. So, uh, and here's another one. This, this didn't, uh, didn't make ice, but the clients didn't like how this looked on their pretty ePay deck. Uh, and I think you were saying you had one recently where that was the original plan, but then you realized it would put water on the driveway in front of the garage. Yeah, you definitely got to follow the route all the way through because yeah. them lines run all different places and then they end up, you know, right outside of where you're parking or walking and next thing you know, it's slippery and messy and, mm -hmm. yeah. And we had one just recently, uh, I think Tom, Tom fixed this, uh, where the water was dripping on the gutter and it was making noise above the deck. And the clients didn't like hearing drip, 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 or I've seen that at the downspout too. It falls down 20 feet and hits the elbow. Yeah, so, you know, plan it out, make it work. Hey, Doug, quick question on the water bugs. Do uh -huh. we have, is there a standard that we have for those? Are those supposed to be used every time we're doing a pan? It's just pans that are on a, you know, first floor or above? We don't, have, we don't have a specification for that. Uh, one of the reasons is a lot of people get these from their security company and they tie into the security system and if something goes wrong, phone calls start going out, which is much more reliable than just something that's supposed to beep if the battery isn't dead. So a lot of people do those on their own. Now if you have a pan and there isn't an emergency drain to the pan, then it's required. So we do use those. And when we do those, we wire it in through the thermostat so it turns the system off if the float switch is tripped? It's a good question. I'll get to that. Um, all right, so what can we do with condensate? In Maryland, it turns out that um, you, you really are not supposed to put air conditioning condensate into the sewer. WSSC, uh, it actually says unmetered water can't go into our sewer. That's the reason for it. So you got to do something else with it, with air conditioning. Uh, you are allowed to put gas furnace or hot water heater condensate into the sewer as long as it's been neutralized. And that means buying this little device, it's like 100 bucks, and the condensate goes through it and it changes it from acidic to neutral. So pretty straightforward. Uh, that's definitely the way to go, I would think, because if you try to run that stuff outside in the winter, it works great until it's 
10 degrees one day and then the end of the pipe freezes and you know two hours later you get a phone call. Uh, so um, we definitely want to put the, those into the house if we can. And then I guess a humidifier drain, because that's metered water, that's allowed in the sewer. Yep. Okay. So it's only yep. air conditioning. Uh, in DC, I talked to our code uh, inspectors, and they said that in areas with a combination storm sewer, you can put anything you want in there because it's the same system. Um, not all of DC has a combination storm sewer, and I'm not 100% sure what the rules are for the rest of it. Uh, but again, uh, in Virginia, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, in Virginia, there's nothing in the code that says you can't put air conditioning condensate into the sewer, but different counties might have different regulations for their sewer system, and it's probably better just to run all air conditioning condensate not into the sewer and everything else into the sewer. Make sense? All right. So as you're saying, they should be level. Uh, I've seen, a, unfortunately, have had the opportunity to see a number of condensate pans fail, mostly ones we didn't do. Um, so here's, uh, here's some examples. Um, first of all, here's an example of one that is not quite as big as you might ideally want. I don't know if you can even tell there's a pan on here. There's about a quarter inch clearance around that duct, and then, and then you have a pan. Um, that's not very big any splashing or any dripping is never going to end up in there. So we really want it to be big. We want it to be at least 8 or 12 inches, in my opinion. And, and I would also say if we're in a finished closet or something like that, just go wall to wall. It's a good, everything's safe if you go wall to wall. Anything splashes on the wall, it lands up in the pan. Um, it also is a good idea, in my opinion, to water test them. It, it helps find if it's out of level. It helps find if there's a leak. Uh, it helps find if it's not fully supported. Mm -hmm. yeah, keep it's all a lot of water, though. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, a lot of water comes out, like 25 gallons a day sometimes for AC rolling out of there. Yeah. And keep the humidifiers and condensate pumps and traps and anything that you can. If you can get it over the pan, that's the thing to do. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so basement si systems are not immune to leaking. And uh, as I've mentioned, not all floor drains are at the low point of a floor. Not all floors slope to a floor drain. It's really safer to just drop a pan under the unit. It's actually required in the 2015 code, which Maryland has adopted, and the other ones will soon. So it's just better. Our, our standard is to put a pan under every unit, no matter where it is. Um, if you're, you know, I think if we build a room that's designed with the floor sloping to a drain, it might be a different story. But that's not what we usually find. Uh, and another quick thing, the system is supposed to be supported up out of the pan because the assumption is the pan will be full of water at some point. You don't want it soaking into the electronics and the insulation and all that. So keep the unit up off the floor. Um, as I said, we've seen a number of issues with these. This one uh, filled up. There's a float switch on the pan, which would have turned it off, but all the water leaked out around the drain connection. So that didn't work too good. Um, here's one where the, the closet was a little bit out of level. and uh, whoever installed it got unlucky and put the float switch on the high side and then the water filled up the pan and poured over the other side before it turned off the system. So uh, this is another thing a water test would have found. You know, it didn't, doesn't really look that out of level. Am I right about that, Nick? When you look at it, it can you tell that that's out of level from that project? It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and then as Vic was already saying, make it big. Make it so everything fits inside. Sometimes on renovations, we add a humidifier, and there's no pan under that part. But you can just add another pan, or you can add a pan that's up higher and tips into the main pan. So you can extend these pans with multiple other pans in a renovation situation. We've done that on a lot of these. Um, but try not to leave us like this, where all the water is piped right outside of the pan. And then if anything goes wrong, we're in big trouble. Make sense? OK, any questions on any of that stuff? OK. Um, so if we have a, a pan that has an emergency drain, right, it's, instead of a float switch, it has a drain going out, we want, we want our clients to notice if water's flowing into the pan and then out that drain because it will ultimately it'll rust out the pan. It, something needs to be fixed, right? It, the water should be going down the other drain, the primary drain. If it's hitting the pan, it's a problem. So in the code, you're supposed to put it in a conspicuous place where that water pours out. And in upstairs systems, the standard practice is to put it over, out the soffit right over a window so people see water pouring down in front of their window. 
and they know to call somebody. Uh, it might take them two or three tries to find the right person. I don't know. It depends on the, uh, the client, right? Uh, but there are other places you can do it. Code, code doesn't say it has to be above a window. There's other, you know, any place that's conspicuous. Any, anyone use anything else besides above a window? I'm trying to think of what that would be. Maybe across the driveway, like that one we just changed our mind about. And then, as I said, uh, pursuant to Dave's question, uh, PAN is supposed to have a water level detection device if it doesn't have an emergency drain, and that's supposed to turn the system off. Um, so that's very easy to do, very inexpensive, and very reliable. OK. Any questions on all that stuff? Great. Yeah, that's an, that's an important one. Um, you don't, don't like to get those phone calls. Um, OK. So let's talk about ductwork and, uh, and flex duct. So one of the interesting things that, that, uh, that I didn't know when I started was you, you can't just take a 14 by 14 duct and make it into a, like an 8 by 8 duct and, and, and still have the system work. I didn't really understand that, that was these sizes come out of a calculator. And if you change them a lot, they don't work. Um, so there, there actually is a way to change the configuration of it. You can go from a square, like if someone wants to put a 12 by 12 down a closet, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, that'll take up all this space in the closet, and the, what's left next to it is no use. Can we make it flatter and go into the side? And so there, is the, there are these calculators. Uh, did, did you say you had one? Oh, there you go. <laughs> what do you know? So if you want to change a 12 by 12, you put that in. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the narrower you get, the width goes out just what is it exponentially it's you know okay. it's not just 12 by 12 we'll go to 10 by 14 but then once you start getting into eight or to a six inch you end up at like 20 26 by six okay and uh for main trunk duck really don't go any narrower than six inches right so is it is it uh the friction sort of thing like yes yeah. okay and in the branch lines where they tap out of it i mean in, in a little narrow duck there's just not enough air moving all the way across it to feed a, a single branch line sufficiently okay. Okay, good to know. So your duct person can recalculate the duct size, but expect it to change a lot, especially when you try to flatten it out. This is something relatively new. Uh, I think we're all used to this now. A couple years ago, code changed, and you can no longer use a framing cavity as a duct. You have to install duct work in the framing cavity. Pretty straightforward. Every once in a long while, we get someone who kind of wants to do that, and we have to talk them out of it. Just make sure we do that. Uh, it turns out there's a wrong way to install flex duct. Um, you know, in our jobs, we don't use a whole lot of flex duct, uh, particularly Wyant's jobs. They only use it for the last straight run off of a system. Um, but it is very important that it gets stretched out and not get bunched up and have extra curves in it. It really cuts down the efficiency. So you can see in these pictures, the, this picture over here says how to do it correctly very sh short and tight. And this picture all bunched out and not pulled tight is the wrong way. Um, and DC actually holds us to seven foot max. Oh, really? Of a flex length, yeah. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. So DC, seven feet max. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be supported every four feet and have minimal sagging. Now, you were saying that you could get, come up to a, a new installation and it would look like it didn't have much sagging, but it can change over time? Yeah, a lot of them say at five feet, you know, and it's, it's a new fresh piece of flex. You've got five feet between the straps. It looks like it's straight and round. You're back here two years later doing a service call and it ain't straight and round and nice anymore. Flex works well, but you got to support it a lot and you got to keep the kinks and hard turns and stuff out of it. Yeah, every once in a while, you guys have probably all seen this, you go in an attic and there's a piece that goes from like here over to there, over a two by four, and you're just thinking, how's, you know, it's nothing but curves and kinks. How's any air going through there? And the answer is it probably isn't. Yeah. So we just have to be careful and make sure it gets all stretched out and that it's fully supported. Yeah, it's gonna kink at those straps too. If it's just five or 10 feet between straps, it might not look kinked at first. It will eventually kink. That's why strapping them every, you know, three or four feet is gonna prevent that. And there's some new news on this. You can see the bottom picture here. It's shown resting on the joists in the attic. And a lot of times uh, we haven't done that because the code officials around here had interpreted code that ducts should not be in the insulation. But in the next code cycle, there's gonna be a bunch of specific uh, provisions in the code about burying ducts under the attic insulation. 
which really increases efficiency and makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. So we'll probably, uh, you know, if we're ever in a situation now where that would make sense, we can probably ask the code officials, can we do this? Um, there's a couple of tricks to it, but I think we'll probably be doing that a lot more. You know, if you, if you think about, you don't want a, a duct with R8 of insulation facing your hot attic in the summer. You want it under R20 of insulation, right? Okay, so this is an interesting one. Where do you put dampers? Um, we, we've gone all over the map on this. Um, this, is a, this is one in an attic. Uh, turned out the clients in this particular house, one part of the house is behaving a lot differently from the other, and they had to switch the behavior between summer and winter, which is, pre this is pretty normal, right? Your south-facing upstairs rooms need a lot of air in the summer, and they don't need hardly any in the winter. And, and you, you know, your north-facing first floor room, it's the other way around. They need lots of air in the winter, and they don't need much in the summer. So it's normal for us to have to change where the air is going. And it's good for us to fit in these dampers ahead of time so it's easy to switch them around. Um, but they do have a cost, and you, if you're not sure where, they're, where you're going to need them, uh, sometimes it makes sense to fit them in later. Um, so I guess the, you know, it's a judgment call where we put them. But generally speaking, if you have a system that goes to two different floors, you're going to want to separate the two floors and have dampers for each floor um, whenever possible. Hey, John. Yes. Um, well, we, I do, I, do uh, I want to talk about that a little bit later, um, and the short story is a little bit more complicated than you might have thought. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on where to put dampers? Well, definitely it's got to be accessible. Each main trunk's got to have a damper, and where they're accessible, like through an attic, we're putting them on every branch line. Gotcha. Um, you know, first floors, you know, it's drywalled in, you don't have that, but most first floors are pretty open floor plans. And they're more forgiving than the second floor where you're behind closed doors and stuff. Gotcha. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, refrigerant lines, it turns out that it's not that hard to deal with these for the most part. Uh, anywhere within 50 feet uh, of the indoor unit, you can put your outdoor unit. Um, you can usually go quite a bit further than that with a little bit of calculating and spending a little bit more money. You might have to oversize the lines and buy more refrigerant, which has gotten to be kind of expensive. Uh, one important thing, though, unlike in this picture, don't put them underground. Um, the ground is very conductive, and it just sucks the heat out of the lines. So it's particularly uh, this, this house has uh, heat pumps, and Vic was saying it takes about 20 minutes for them to start warming up because the ground is just taking all the heat out of the lines before it can even get to the house. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, we have done before a, a kind of a like kind of made a tunnel like with a big piece of pipe and try to keep it in the air with a piece of pipe that's open on both ends, but it's better to just avoid that altogether. Um, okay. All right, here's one that uh, I didn't, didn't really understand the implications of until I had seen what happens. Um, all these units, outdoor units, are, require a huge amount of airflow. And if that airflow is interrupted or slowed down, it makes them much less efficient. It can even cut the capacity of the units by quite a bit. So this particular fence, it kind of looks like it's a little bit open, but there, there happens to be four units behind this fence. It's, they're all packed pretty tightly together. And uh, here's a bigger picture of it. <clears throat> um, we were having some capacity issues in this house, and we measured the temperature going in. And it was 30 degrees warmer than the outside air. So it's 90 something degrees outside. It's like 120 degrees inside the fence. That air conditioner thinks it's in Dubai and it can't, can't work like it's in Virginia. So uh, we changed it. The architect came up with this uh, design where the lower ones uh, were at an angle to allow the air to flow in. And that brought, uh, brought us back a couple of tons of capacity on this particular building. Uh, here's a similar one. Started off with a diagonal tongue and groove board. And then we just took all the boards off and tilted them a little bit so that it, had, it allowed a lot of airflow in to make the system work. Um, you can make a pretty fence that's mostly open that still looks good. Uh, this is the direction I would go in if clients think they need a fence. Just make a fence with a ton of holes. Try to make it big enough so someone can almost fit in there and work. <laughs> They'll do it. Um, or you can do like this one. This one, it's, it's pretty open, especially with that big gap under the bottom. And uh, the, 
I, I'm not 100% sure who did it. I think Abadad might have built this. But these panels are totally removable. So it's a really pretty looking fence, right? But uh, uh, any HVAC, even an HVAC guy can figure out how to get this open. Um, you know, sometimes we build them and it takes 15 star drive screws to undo the panel. That's not very good on a hot day. They have 15 calls. Just make it so it can easily come off. Yep. Overhead obstructions are a big deal too. Uh, good, good point. You can, a couple air conditioners sitting underneath of a deck that's 10 feet off of the ground, it'll blow your mind how hot it'll be under that deck, 15, 20 degrees hotter than the rest oh. of the backyard. So yeah, the standard ones discharge vertically. If you block that, they don't work very well. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's another one. There's, there are HVAC units behind here, but because it's so bright, you don't really see them. And then lastly, if we have clients who are really object to a fence or to these outdoor units, give them geothermal. Um, there's no outdoor units to worry about. So it's a really nice setup, uh, particularly when you have a house that has 8, 10, 15 systems. Um, if they're all sitting in the sub-basement, <laughs> it's a good place to hide them. Uh, sometimes you just run out of space to put all those outdoor units. Okay, talk about duct sealing. Um, we've updated our HVAC standard. We're now gonna ask all of our contractors to meet the 2012 duct sealing requirements, which is to mastic all the joints and test all the systems unless they're completely within the envelope of the building. That's not required in Virginia, but it is already required in DC and Maryland, so it's not a huge step. Um, but leaky ductwork outside the envelope can be a huge problem for comfort, right? You're always blowing air out into your attic. In the summertime, you have to suck lots of humid air into your house to make up for the losses through those leaks. It can make your house very uncomfortable. So that's pretty straightforward. Here's some ductwork uh, with mastic all over it. Um, well, I'm sure we've all seen this, right? The goop they put on all the joints. Uh, so uh, Vic was saying that that's sort of standard procedure now for everywhere that he works. You just automatically do mastic on all the systems. And this really wasn't that way 10 years ago. So I think most, most contractors are on board with that. Um, there are different standards in Maryland, DC, and Virginia for the requirements for the testing, but uh, we're gonna have people, even though in Virginia you're supposed to be able to do a visual inspection, we're gonna have them meet the DC standard. <laughs> One interesting thing that we found on some jobs, if you have the closed cell spray foam truck coming out, closed cell spray foam works as a sealer and an insulator, so that may be less expensive than doing all that mastic and then adding the R8, and it will work better. So if you have that truck coming out already, this might be worth looking into. And then one last thing on ductwork, there's a, a really important seal that the duct people aren't there to do, and that's between the metal uh, outlet box and the drywall. So we should either do that ourselves or have our painters do it. That's a leak point that should be, should be sealed. That's a, a big one too. When you're doing the duct blaster tests, that's, ah. that's huge. Okay. Now do you guys normally try to fix that yourselves? Yeah, get in there with some tape or some caulk or whatever, because if you do your duct blaster test at rough end, mm -hmm. we're not even dealing with this, so right. it's, it's easier to get through. If you've got some you've got to do afterwards, you find that's a, that's a big, big leak point. Okay, good to know. All right, and let's talk about a couple quick things here. Um, one thing you can really do to help your subcontractors and help, you know, if you can do them a favor, a lot of times they'll do you a favor, which you will need later, especially on a renovation. Um, I, uh, my personal experience has been if you can help them help plan out their duct route, particularly if you're if you have eye joists, you can cut big holes in the duct in the in the web of the eye joists before you even install them, and then it's really easy for them to put in the ductwork. So that's a great way to get ahead of the game. Usually, there's a duct plan that shows how big that trunk line down the middle needs to be, and you can call the eye joist engineers and make sure that you can make a hole big enough for it. Um, so that's a that's a good thing you can do. Um, with open web joists, you can ask for a duct space in a particular location and they can rejigger the braces so that everything's lined up correctly for them. So let's try to take care of that. Um, another quick thing, I mean, you were saying if you can keep the ductwork inside the envelope, it's worth It's a real right? big deal, yeah. And the design calcs that we do, you can probably save about 15% capacity on your equipment sizing if you can get your ductwork inside a conditioned envelope as opposed to like in the attic. And you know, sometimes that's a big deal to get it inside, and that's, you know, the attic is an easy place to put it, but your equipment's actually larger because your system is in the attic. Right. 
Um, so we're, uh, there's a few ways you can do this, even if you're mostly working with a, a, an attic that you're going to insulate the ceiling of. Um, I got just to have a couple pictures from some jobs that I visited. Here's one where they ran drywall over top of where the soffit is going to be, along here. And then they hung the ductwork under that, taped it to the new drywall, and then built another soffit to enclose that. So all the insulation and the air seal is above the ductwork, and the ductwork is inside the house. Similarly, you can order trusses with a space that you can fill up with ductwork and then run a flat ceiling across underneath later. Um, that's another way to do it. Um, so, I mean, we haven't done a lot of this, and I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure it's worth going crazy, but it is possible to do it even with a with a, a design that doesn't seem like there's room for ductwork. You can fit it in. Okay. Uh, one thing I definitely want to mention is I've never seen an under well all the under slab systems I've been involved with is because there's a problem, right? There's like there's water in there. There's rats in there. There's mold in there. They can't get any heat out because it all gets absorbed by the gravel. Um, these are just a really, really bad idea. Uh, I, I would go so far as to say if, you've, if, you think, if you're doing a design and you think you need to put ducts under the slab, think about doing a crawl space. Um, it might not cost all that much different anyway. By the time we do all the rough-ins and, and groundworks, uh, you know, plumbers and HVAC people have to charge a lot more for that stuff that's sealed for going under a slab than for the regular stuff that goes in a crawl space. So sometimes you can't avoid it, but more often we're being asked to fill them in and replace them because they just don't work very well. All right. Okay, so tell us about returns in bedrooms. I think they're a must if you want to be able to come close to keeping temperatures even because you go up there and you got closed doors and, you know, sun coming through the window in one room and not in the other. If you can't stir that air and mix it, without a return, you can push supply in there to where you literally pressurize the room and you're just not getting a lot of flow out of it anymore. You've got to give it a return and just, just keep things equalized, keep them moving. And an undercut on a door, if you do the calculations, you'd have to have about a two and a half or three inch undercut, which nobody's really going to accept. So to have some sort of a return in the bedroom, Transfer grills and stuff can work. Um, you know, an actual ducted return is a preferred method. If you can't get a duct in there, you can start for plan B, look at transfers or jumper ducts. So jumper duct is just a short section of duct that goes from the room to a hallway or whatever. And a transfer grill is uh, either two grills or a device that, that's supposed to block some of the sound and light. They don't work perfectly, though. Okay, good to know. All right, any questions on any of that stuff? All right. Okay, let's talk about a bunch of a uh, bunch of detail things that we have to know about. Um, so, as you know, when we put in a big range hood over 400 cfm, we're required to put in a makeup air vent. Um, now, recently, we've pretty much gotten away from this on many of our projects by installing range hoods that are under 400 cfm. I think that's our general. Our <laughs> general rule nowadays. I think it's the best way. Um, it used to be that you know Viking said you had to have a 1200 CFM range, but for some reason they just crossed that off and put you just need a range hood. So we've been we've been putting in 400 CFM once, so that's good. Um, but uh, a makeup air system uh, here's an example of one we installed. It's just an air inlet on the outside of the house with a you know a duct going into the house and a mechanized damper that opens when the range hood is on. So you need to have uh, power to that. You need to have a sensor that, that knows when the range hood is on. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that that they're pretty easy, pretty simple to do. But you, do, you usually have to have a wire going from one to the other. And the uh, question is, where do, you, where do you put that makeup air? Um, we, and if we've it, done this a lot, right? Yeah, if it goes, well, you can go into the return of the air handler, but you're also risking shocking the equipment because you got a 120 degree furnace and you throw 30 degree air in it, you can cause cracks and stuff like that into a furnace. And then otherwise they ask you to put it into the room or a room that communicates, well you got 1200 CFM now of outside either hot, humid or really cold wintertime air. It's a, it's a tough one to introduce in any kind of acceptable fashion really. Right. So uh, 
this, this is what we used to do. We used to plug it into the return on the nearest uh, HVAC system. Um, but there, you know, and it isn't just the problem with it being too cold in the winter. In the summertime, that air is really humid. It hits the cold ductwork. It can cause a lot of condensation inside the ductwork. Um, but so far, we haven't, that I know of, we haven't actually seen any problems with it. So I'm, I'm not sure that's the worst way to go. I think it's, it seems like it works OK. Um, this is an example of one where a contractor insisted that we put it in the ceiling of the kitchen. Um, and it, but it worked fine. Right, Scotty? Yeah. So no complaints, even though it should be pouring cold air in on them or hot air, it seemed like it worked OK. And then I've read in a couple places that you could try to put a grill right behind your giant fancy range, and then the air would come in and get warmed up by the range. Or if it's in the summertime, most of it ends up going up the hood anyway. So that might be an approach we can use if we're not comfortable putting it in the return. Okay. Uh, an important thing to know if you're planning to add any ventilation air into the house, you want to keep it 10 feet away from anything that you don't want to be breathing. And it turns out that that, that can get kind of complicated. Like all over your roof, you have plumbing vents. Um, uh, at the ground level, there's streets, alleyways, flue outlets from your high efficiency furnace. It, it can be challenging, especially on the townhouse situation, to find a good place that doesn't have anything within 10 feet. OK, let's talk about thermostat location. Um, this is, a, this is a project uh, where you can see this spot of sun here. Um, in the afternoon, this sun beam came up like this across the thermostat. And it would make the air conditioner run for like three hours and just go crazy. Temperature would go down to you know, 55 degrees, except in that spot of sun on the thing. And it was causing some serious comfort and, and even mold issues in this building. So that's an important point. You got to keep your thermostat where it's not sensing stuff it shouldn't be sensing, right? Pretty straightforward. Don't put it under a supply register. <laughs> I actually saw that once. Mm -hmm. The system would turn on and blow hot air on the thermostat and turn off. Uh, dimmer switches is another one that. Yeah, there you go. If it's above a dimmer switch, they generate a lot of heat and that'll throw it off. Yeah. And then one one thing that we've found is uh, uh, houses that have more than one system. If you put the upstairs system's thermostat in the hallway. All winter long, the heat from downstairs rises up and keeps the hallway warm. So that thermostat is not going to turn on the upstairs heat, and any closed bedrooms will not stay warm. So we got to put that in, you, you said in the master bedroom. We go in the master bedroom, yeah. So we'll put the thermostat in a room, usually the master bedroom. Uh, programmable thermostats code, but everybody hates them. So you guys are using high-end touchscreen ones. Go ahead, Dante. There's ways to get them to average. Um, it hasn't really proven to be a real good solution in the past. It seems like averaging just means now nobody's completely happy. <laughs> but yeah, you know, putting different sensors in there, it's, it's ideally if you can get a duct system that's just going to share and equalize the air through the room, you're going to be better off. Uh, breaking down the zones into rooms, most of the equipment we're using isn't going to work well in that kind of a application. Yeah. yeah. In fact, let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, <clears throat> zoning controls, Josh asked about this too. So a zoning control, if you read some of the advertising for them, they, make it, they try to make it sound like if you put this special controller with all a bunch of motorized dampers that you can make each room its own temperature, and the system will be able to do that. But our experience has been that that is not, does not really work the way sometimes people hope it will. Because at the end of the day, you have one box that mo most of which can only put out one amount of air with one amount of heat or cooling. And it's never the right amount for this space. And then, so y you find that uh, you know, this space gets cooled off in three seconds. And then this space calls, and the system never stops running. The worst ones we've found is when uh, people try to have two different temperatures. It wants to heat this space, and then a little bit of heat gets into all the other rooms and warms them up. And then they all try to cool, and then it cools off this space from the extra air that's blowing through the dampers. 
And basically, the system just keeps going back and forth with heat and cool. And it's, some of the spaces are really uncomfortable. Um, so they don't really work very well. Um, so a couple things you need to know is you really, it's really almost impossible to keep different temperatures on the same system, no matter how your controls and dampers are set up. So if someone wants to keep the temperature more even, you can put in two or three or maybe four zones, and it'll tend to keep all four of those zones at the right temperature. I think you were saying you prefer only two zones. Yeah, I try to keep it to two. Yeah. So, you know, we've had systems where people put in 10 zones. That did not work. Um, and people trying to keep it at different temperatures, that also does not work. Yeah, if you got a system that's a four ton putting out around 1600 CFMs, and you got one room that needs 150 CFMs, you know, you got something to do with all the rest of that air. Some of the systems we put a bypass in, dumps it right in the return. The system gets too cold right away in the air conditioning mode. There's a sensor that shuts it off. You're still on and off and on and off. That room's getting handled a little bit. You got other rooms with different demands that it just can't keep up and modulate and do all of those different things. Uh, we try to zone preferably like a system per floor is ideal. Um, and then I might split it into two zones and go like front and back, which are north and south, you know, and you can do, it's more of a balancing system would be a better name for it than a zoning system <clears throat> yeah. and do a little balancing. But yeah, trying to achieve different temperatures, it really can't do. And just trying to go, even if you have one system doing a first floor and a second floor, it's such different demands, it's gonna have a hard time. You can get them a little closer together. If you can just use two separate systems, then you're gonna just do whatever you wanna do. One other quick point on this, there are, uh, as we know, there are these higher end furnaces and air conditioners that have variable speed and variable capacity, and the better zone controls know that they, they, they automatically turn the system down to the lower speed or lower capacity when it doesn't need the full capacity. Those work much better than the kinds that have this bypass damper. So just try to buy the expensive stuff if you're gonna do zone system, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, I think this will be our last thing for the day. A uh, Couple of quick things about what we do and don't do in condos. So most of the buildings that we work in, we should not and are not allowed to and do not do HVAC, right? The building has their own engineers, they have their own subcontractors, and everything else being equal, even if they would let us work on the system, it's much better to let those folks work on the system. They'll, they'll be there to maintain it, they have people in the building every day, it's much better to have it all on them. Um, every once in a while we work in a building where the owners are responsible for the equipment and we'll swap something out for them. Uh, but usually we try to avoid that uh, for good reason. And in particular, um, we really don't want to, you know, make $100 installing a humidifier that causes a $300,000 leak that damages four units in a building that we want to keep everyone happy. So we're not going to do humidifiers in condos. We could do a $10 million leak. That would be a lot of business for us. Um, <laughs> How much insurance do we have? Yeah, 17, <laughs> right, right. Uh, so that's our bottom line, no humidifiers and try to avoid the rest of it. Okay, we're gonna call it there. Thank you, Vic, sure. really appreciate Thank the time. You. Thank you.